Well, thank you all for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate um, your time and, and making time for this conversation today. Uh, my name is Doki Fasihi, and I'm the Deputy Chief of Strategy and Program at Issue One. Um, Issue One is committed to achieving bipartisan federal reforms that protect and strengthen our democracy. As part of our Trust in Free and Fair Elections program, last week we hosted our second fly-in of election officials to Washington, D.C. Um, this is part of our Faces of Democracy program, which is a bipartisan group of 43 election officials and workers committed to two goals, winning much needed election funding and election worker protections. Two dozen of our election officials and poll workers traveled to Washington, D.C. last week. We met with nearly 60 congressional offices. Uh, we met with 40 members themselves. We also met with officials in the executive branch. Uh, the White House, the Department of Homeland Security, and the Department of Justice. Um, some of the concerns and stories our election officials shared, lack of funding, running elections on duct tape, disinformation generated by advanced AI, death threats, stalking, PTSD among their coworkers, an exodus of competent senior staffers from the election administration field, the continued sway of the Stop the Steal movement over too many voters, state legislators, legislatures push, pushing restrictive legislation, floods of records requests jamming up their offices, the misguided trend toward hand counting of ballots, and denier dominated election boards. The officials called on Congress to allocate federal resources to run our elections, which was labeled as critical infrastructure in 2017 by the Department of Homeland Security. They also called for anti-doxing measures to protect their personal information. They called on federal government to do more and to enact a zero tolerance policy on threats against election workers. I now wanna turn it over to our esteemed Faces of Democracy members who were here with us last week during the fly-in to tell you more about what their observations were. First, I'd like to introduce Secretary of State Cisco Aguilar. Secretary Aguilar was elected as Nevada Secretary of State in 2022 and assumed office on January 2nd, 2023. Prior to being elected, Aguilar served as general counsel for Agassi Graf, the management company for Andre Agassi and Stephanie Graf, and the Andre Agassi Foundation for Education. He was responsible for communications and media, marketing and brand management, strategic partnerships, and legal and government affairs. He also served as special counsel to the chancellor of the Nevada System of Higher Education, Jim Rogers, and as a lawyer for the parent company of the Las Vegas and Reno NBC affiliates. Secretary Aguilar also launched a sports technology startup company, Blueprint Sports and Entertainment, connecting athletes and brands where they live and play. In recent years, he worked at Adidas Global Headquarters in Germany, as a member of the brand sustainability team through a transatlantic fellowship with a Robert Bosch Stiftung. Secretary Aguilar is the founding chairman of the Cristo Rey St. Vider College Preparatory High School. Cristo Rey serves students in one of Las Vegas' most vulnerable neighborhoods and provides an innovative work study program designed to prepare them for future careers. Governors Jim Gibbons and Brian Sandoval appointed him to the Nevada Athletic Commission, which regulates boxing and mixed martial arts. He served on the commission for eight years, two of which he served as chairman. Next, I'd like to introduce Tanya Wichman, who is the director of Defiance County Board of Elections, Ohio. Tanya began her career as the Defiance County Board of Elections in May 2015. She worked with her team to implement new election voting, transition from paper poll, books to electronic, enhanced security at her office through the directive of the Ohio Secretary of State, and built a team of election specialists, seasoned employees, vote location manager, and poll workers who deserve much credit to the successful elections in Defiance County. Wichman is certified as an Ohio registered elections official, has completed a master's certificate in high performance leadership through NACO, and completed national certification as a certified election registration administrator through Auburn University in Alabama and the Election Center in Texas. She has served for 17 elections in Defiance County, including two presidential years. She's also a member of the Ohio Association of Elections Officials 
and serves on the legislative committee. Wichman has been a mentor for four other counties through the Ohio Secretary of State Mentorship Program before serving on the Board of Elections. Wichman managed two businesses with her husband for 17 years. She enjoys spending time through outreach programs with local schools, nursing homes, and organizations in the Defiance County area. Along with her husband, she founded the Election Ambassador Scholarship Program through the Defiance Area Foundation as a way to engage and educate future leaders of Defiance County. And finally, Dustin Zarni, who is the Elections Commissioner of Onondaga County Board of Elections in New York. Dustin is a Democrat, is a long political activist in Syracuse, New York, and has served as Onondaga County's Election Commissioner since January 1st, 2013. He quickly became known as a behind the scenes political operative specializing in get out the vote operations. During his political career, he was often called upon to serve as an advisor and an electoral law and parliamentary procedure. In 2017, his fellow Democratic commissioners and the New York State Election Commissioners Association selected him to serve as caucus chair, and he continues to serve in that capacity. As caucus chair, he organizes and leads the Democratic Election Commissioners from the diverse 62 counties throughout New York State, in this role, he often appears in front of the New York State Legislature, advocating not only for his caucus, but for all the county boards of elections. He has been proud to be a part of successful campaigns to bring direct funding to local boards since 2019. He also has worked on vital reforms such as early voting, the unified June primary, voter registration reform, absentee ballot canvassing reforms, and electronic poll books. During the 2020 census and redistricting period, he advanced, he excuse me, he advocated for citizen-led redistricting in New York State. In 2019, he led a successful effort to change the city of Syracuse's charter to bring citizen redistricting to New York for the first time. And in 2022, the Syracuse Common Council made history by passing these maps to be in place for the 2023 election. He hopes this success will lead to similar reforms in Onondaga County and New York State. So welcome to all three of you and thank you very much for joining us. Our event will include about 30 minutes of conversation um, with our officials and then we'll leave time for question and answer at the end. Um, so please hold your questions and then um, we'll get to them uh, one by one. Um, I'd like to start by asking our officials a few questions. I'll start with Secretary Aguilar. Secretary, uh, can you share first your firsthand experience of participating in last week's fly-in here with us in Washington? Uh, what were the most important observations and memorable, memorable moments um, during your conversations and discussions? What were your most sort of interesting interactions? Well, good morning, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here and truly to be a part of this team is really important as we move forward for the 2024 election. You know, Dustin and Tanya do the hard work. They are on the ground level. They are working directly to execute our elections. You know, I, as secretary, I have the opportunity to work with our 17 county clerks and registers to ensure we have the best elections we can have. But being in DC and talking with our elected leaders, I think one of the most critical points was understanding that poll workers are American heroes. And we need to understand that. And we cannot have the elections that we have if we don't have the human component to do the work we need them to do. And they need to feel safe in the space that they're doing it. We had a tough situation in the Secretary of State's office last election cycle where some of our team members had to deal with somebody who didn't appreciate the work they did and made their lives very difficult. Not only their lives, but the lives of their families and their children, which is unacceptable. And so hearing and being able to tell those stories directly to our leaders was really, really important. But the other important part is the sustainable funding for elections. Right now, we're working off of you know scrap pieces to put things together with duct tape, but that's not sustainable. We really need our leaders to look at the situation and understand that being reactionary is not a solution. We need to be strategic in our approach. We need investment that is continuous and sustainable so that we can plan accordingly and use the investment in the best way possible. What I was really surprised about, again, was just seeing the groundworking election officials come to Capitol Hill and be passionate about what they do and explain why they do it. Thankfully in Nevada, I think we have two leaders in Congress who sit on the Appropriations Committee who understand this approach. And both of them are opposite parties. We have our Congressman Amade in the North and we have our Congresswoman in the South, Susie Lee, 
who understand why this investment is important and seeing them being able to work together and hear them make that commitment to work together to ensure that Nevada has the resources it needs. However, they depend on their colleagues throughout the rest of the country. And hopefully we can use their message and their voice and their partnership to sell that idea and concept for the rest of the country. Thank you very much, Secretary. Appreciate your remarks there. Um, I wanna turn it to Tanya and I'm gonna ask you the same question, Tanya. What, how did you see last week's experience coming to Washington? What were your most memorable moments, takeaways, observations? I think it was nice to actually have a voice um, from the level of government we work at. We are based on directive on how we do things. And sometimes it doesn't always relay to um, upper level government. Um, when decisions are made, um, we encourage our leaders to engage with the people who are running elections. Um, maybe we can find some of the flaws that could be in the legislation before it gets to the level where we're running it on top of an election, trying to fix things as we go. Um, I truly found joy in like meeting Dustin in the elevator um, when I first got there. You know, we'd look at each other and by the time we got to where we were supposed to go, we had already talked about, okay, we use this equipment and we do this. And, and the excitement of, you know, a letter opener in a board of elections office is huge because we had funding for it. Um, but we have already in our county implemented new equipment in 2019. The issue we're running into now is not consistent federal funding. They, we just got a notice actually today that they're going to raise our, our yearly maintenance fee. Um, and we're a small county, but raise it $11,000. Well, for a small county, that's, that's actually a lot of money that has to come out of the county budget that they didn't plan on. I'm gonna have to replace $18,000 worth of batteries that wasn't in the budget and now going into a presidential year needing more money. Um, it was nice to get to explain to our leaders that for instance, in an odd number year in Ohio, we get to charge back to the entities like the school boards, the, the local officials, the townships, those things that the elections that we run for them. But in an even number year, we're actually running the office, you know, on our regular budget, but not being able to charge anything back. We're putting the federal leaders in their office. So having consistent funding from year to year to be able to make sure everything is at its highest standard is something that they really need to realize is necessary. And you, you told me recently, Tanya, that um, you now have a, a special election that was, you know, we well we didn't expect um, and ex expressed concern about the resources to run that given the general election and primaries coming up. Yeah, they have actually just allocated some of the money, but it's evidently going to be reimbursed to us. We don't have a reimbursement date. Mm -hmm. um, we did not plan on that election. So um, and actually they just changed the ballot language this week um, due to a lawsuit. So we spent the morning reprogramming the entire election to change the ballot. So we kind of had to start over again. Um, but it's just one of those, we still have to recruit the same amount of poll workers and it's one question, you know, and, and they're entitled, you know, General Assembly is entitled to do that. And we understand that it's our job to run it, but it's, it's very difficult. We're gonna end up, there's two full-time people in my office. We're gonna run um, four elections in 10 months with the primary we just finished. We'll have the August election, we'll have a November election and our primary is going to be in March. So, you know, I was really excited. They added my week of vacation this year um, for being here eight years, um, but I maxed out my vacation at the limit for the last seven years anyway. So it didn't really, you know, there's, there's a mental exhaustion, there's a physical exhaustion, um, election officials, you know, they, they say our biggest compliment should be that we make it look easy because we're really good at what we do. But the more we make it look easy, the more we get to do. <laughs> right. Thank you for making time to come here and, and, and talk to, to Congress and, and other decision makers, given everything else that, um, that you're doing. Dustin, I want to turn to you and ask the same question. What were your, your biggest takeaways last week coming to Washington? Um, did you find the experience valuable? What, 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 what were your thoughts? What are your thoughts? Well, last week uh, was uh, one of the highlights of my activist career. I really uh, enjoyed the trip so much. And one of the reasons was uh, the bipartisan nature of the group that uh, issue one brought together. We had Republicans and Democrats in the room. We 
didn't really know who was an R and D when we came in. Uh, when Tanya and I met in the elevator, we, I didn't know she was a Republican. She didn't know I was a Democrat. But we were just talking shop and talking about how to make elections better. And that uh, that amount of shared perspective and shared purpose was something that I found uplifting and inspired by. Um, I hope that we were able to. Uh, you know, communicate that to the members of Congress that we met with as well. Um, but I did notice that, like, on the other, you know, there, when meeting with uh, the members of Congress, there wasn't necessarily always that shared purpose as well. They, some of them said that they wanted to help us, but they didn't know if somebody on the other side of the aisle will do it. They, they you know, and, and so especially when it comes down to funding, the myth that the federal government has no role in local elections is uh, something that I, I found a little disconcerting from some of our members we met with and why it's so important for um, issue one to be able to bring us out there and meet with them directly and talk to them about how much of our uh, budget uh, goes towards federal contests and federal issues, how, many, how much federal regulations impacts our daily life, and, and, and the amount of resources we have to spend. And that when they do uh, give us funds, that if they put uh, too many strings on it and, and, and too much uh, uh, focus on uh, restricting how the locals use the funds, instead of tr trusting our local elected officials uh, that are in charge of elections to be able to use those funds appropriately, that it creates a little bit of waste in there as opposed to when they don't restrict those funds and we're able to choose how we need how do we how we need to spend it because with the thousands of counties in uh, in America in different uh, election jurisdictions, uh, each one is need, has different needs. So that's what I took away uh, was that uh, that it was good to talk to these members and explain to them the problems on the ground. And of course, then hearing some of the horror stories out there about some of the protections that are needed for election workers. Uh, not just on a uh, you know personal level, but uh, protecting our offices in general, protecting uh, our ability to service the voters as well, and uh, you know protecting us against individual threats, but also threats uh, from uh, you know these organized groups that are uh, doxing election officials and um, and and trying to go after their very employment. Yeah. Thank you, Dustin. And I, I think last week was a massive, massive education effort um, that um, was brought to Congress. I think um, we, in that process, elevated um, the, the, the two issues, uh, protections and funding as the core issues that um, uh, should be advanced in any bipartisan way. So, um, it was it was I think a big uh, a big effort that will hopefully pay off. Um, so let me turn to the next uh, question I have, um, which does go back to something you were saying, Dustin. Um, some people think that we're out of the woods um, as it relates to our elections and our democracy. That sort of the danger is past. Um, I'm curious what you would tell them. I want to start with Secretary Aguilar. What are the most pressing concerns and issues that you're facing? in your state um, as a state election official um, and as you prepare for 2024. I think you're muted, Secretary. Apologies. One is disinformation, making sure we're ahead of the communication cycle to be able to tell the truth and get the information out there before the, we allow those other individuals to control the narrative for us. The other is goes back to the human component. We need to ensure we have people who are ready and able to work polls who are able and ready to work the administrative process of counting ballots and accepting ballots and verifying ballots. You know, in my office, we have about a 30% vacancy rate because people still think it's a dangerous place to work and that's not acceptable. We have to change that narrative. Fortunately, Nevada legislature and our governor saw that issue at the forefront of what it is and passed legislation to make it a felony to harass and intimidate election workers. We also passed some anti-doxing laws that will help us in that recruitment initiative, both in my office and at the local level as well. Again, we have to recognize the importance of poll workers and that they are the American heroes of democracy. Thank you, Secretary. Turning to you, Tanya, can you share with us what, what you're facing and what your, your biggest concerns are 
uh, and challenges ahead of 2024? I will say we, again, we're from a very small county, um, which means I pretty much know by name every one of my full workers, um, every one of our seasonals. We're just like our own little family here. And I had one of our full workers actually come in today. He brought his slip back that he was going to work because he thought he'd save us the stamp and brought the envelope back of everything we sent out to him and gives me a hug. And he goes, I'm going to work, but my wife thinks it's too dangerous for me to be out there. Um, we had a altercation situation in his polling location last time um, that was handled, but it got a little loud. And, you know, we had a high school girl working for the first time. She was over in a corner crying, thinking this guy was going to come back and, and in her words, shoot up the place because he was so mad when he left. You know, that's the mental status of where our poll workers are. And that's not even the election officials who have worked since 2020, went through a pandemic. I mean, the worst thing I felt about 2020, and and don't get me wrong, we found out our election was canceled the day before the election <laughs> um, for the primary, but I have to send those people out. How do I protect them? There's there's no consequences we um, for someone, you know, and, and I, everyone has their right to free speech, but if you're as an intoxicated voter had done in one of my polling locations, sexually harassing my poll workers, threatening to punch one in the face because she was a Democrat and we do everything in a bipartisan team. And there's no consequence to that. You know, they he got a hundred dollar fine for disorderly conduct and public intoxication, but how do I protect my poll workers and say, it's okay, we're gonna make sure you're safe. So I, I think that type of thing to be able to discuss what's happening, um, I'm concerned for the safety of my people. That's just, it's the mom in me that just wants to make sure everybody's taken care of. And, and I think it's important to realize that these threats aren't just words anymore. It's things that have to be taken seriously. Thanks, Tanya. How about Dustin? Um, what are your concerns in New York and Onondaga County? Well, resources is always our number one concern. Uh, 2024 is looking like, uh, I, I, I forgot, I think it was Bruce uh, uh, Brown from Virginia kept saying this when we were there uh, last week. He kept saying that uh, 2024 is going to make 2020 look like a minor league baseball game. And I agree. Uh, I think we're going to see uh, a very high, intense election with no real pandemic restrictions, which is going to maybe even drive uh, voter turnout, especially in-person turnout through the roof. Um, and uh, without the resources needed to be able to staff our polling places, to be able to train our workers, to be able to buy new equipment. A lot of our boards are, have aging equipment. And the time is now to start thinking about 2024. And I think often our elected officials wait until 2024 to allocate resources or start thinking about it. And that's too late for us. Uh, it's, uh, we are, you know, in, in many ways, 2023 is our dress rehearsal for 2024. We have local elections, but we're preparing to get ready for 2024. Um, and the temperature uh, that is out there, the political temperature that is out there, it does not seem to be going down. And I do, you know, there are a lot of people who looked at the 2022 elections and said, well, you know, we survived and everything's great and democracy won and so we can relax. But they're not digging into some of the stories that we're hearing from across uh, the country. Uh, Bill Gates, who was, um, uh, you know, is who from Maricopa County, uh, because of that temperature, has announced that he's not seeking re-election in 2024. He's one of our uh, best. Um, in uh, Tarrant County, uh, uh, Texas, uh, Heider Garcia, who was a longtime uh, nonpartisan, one of the best election officials in the nation, he was forced out of his job because elected officials that came in are believing the big lie and wanted to uh, have uh, a uh, have have a sacrifice, uh, you know, ready to go, and that's these are the kind of stories, and this is happening in 2022. So we are not uh, beyond these retaliations. We are not beyond these threats, and uh, and the you know with the 
indictments that have just happened. I, I think we're going to see even more and more and more uh, raising of the temperature. And, uh, and that's why election officials need to be protected and funded so we can do our job, uh, serve democracy, and also live our lives as well. Thank you, Dustin. And just to mention, Bill Gates and Haider Garcia are both Faces of Democracy members, and it's so sad to see them, you know, resign from their positions. Um, and the list of concerns I read in the beginning um, are impacting our election officials in our cohort, in our campaign, um, just, to be, just to be clear. Um, I want to turn to a question about, um, you know, focusing on the federal government versus, you know, the sort of state legislatures and state government. Um, a lot of democracy groups have changed their focus to either block bad legislation on elections at the state level or try to advance good legislation. Um, issue one is is committed to, to, to working in Congress and building momentum, um, educating members, um, and, and, and achieving um, federal funding and protections at the federal level. I'm curious your perspective on, on how the federal government, in particular, the role of Congress and the administration, um, what role they play um, when it comes to election administration. Secretary, I'll start with you. They're all in those positions because they went through a well-run election, right? And to understand that they understand from the very basis of why elections are important, but to have the conversation and actually do the work are two different things. And unfortunately, I don't think they truly want to do the work it takes to build our election system, to invest in our infrastructure, because they know it's a hard lift given the current situation of politics on the Hill and, and the administration. I think the administration sees it as an issue, having a good conversation with them, but actually thinking what actions are going to come out of that conversation. I don't know, because there are so many priorities. But again, our democracy doesn't work unless we have strong elections. And if we don't invest in the very fundamental that gets us to where we are, and gives the American people a voice, I don't know what to do other than go to my state legislature and go to my governor and present a vision, present a plan and present a strategy to move forward. I think we have to continue to get the states to act and to understand what importance we have. And hopefully if Congress sees action across its home state, they will start to take action. Because right now it's a conversation, but we gotta continue to push that conversation and. The great thing you all did was bring the people that actually are involved in this in a day-to-day -day basis. I can come express my voice, but really it's the poll workers that are directly engaging with voters that have the true personal stories of why this work is important. Thank you. Same question for you, Tanya. Um, what made you come and, and think that speaking to Congress and the administration would be helpful to, to your work? I will tell you um, before I came, to issue one, the reason I was connected with you, um, I was seriously ready to quit my job. Um, I love what I do. I was at a breaking point and, and I'm lucky. Um, I have a great team here at my office. Um, we have great commissioners, a great board, um, but the constant rhetoric on how we cheat and lie and do everything wrong and having to deal with the public records request that says, you know, we're gonna make sure we sue you and take everything you have personally because it's the taxpayers who's paying for your life. So, you know, I should never have to have a conversation with my prosecutor that says, um, who's gonna cover my legal fees? Do you represent me in that situation if they decide to sue me personally for doing my job? Um, those types of things, I, I think it's just getting missed in the big picture that it's a human being that's running these elections, like really your friends, your neighbors, the people that you go to the ball games with and, and accusing them of doing something that's so crazy. Um, I can't speak for everyone. I know Ohio has some really high standards that we've had to do a lot in the last three years, um, raising cybersecurity, um, election security, equipment, everything that we do has been about three times the job that I had probably when I first started. <laughs> um, but we need people to recognize that that security is going to require funding and the states can't cover it by themselves. Um, the counties, I know we have a county here in Ohio that they just didn't even have the money to pay the difference from the federal funding to bring in the new equipment. It took them three years longer to get new equipment 
And they were literally getting pieces from other counties because they don't make the equipment anymore. So those types of things need to be understood um, where it's not just the state needs this as a whole and this state needs this as a whole. There's 88 counties in Ohio. And like Dustin said, there's counties all across the United States that everyone has an individual need and those needs need to be taken into consideration too. Thanks, Tanya. Turning to you, Dustin, same question. The federal government is really the only uh, you know, structure that is able to reach every corner of our country. And we see that there are, even, even inside states, there are you know, counties that have rich resources that can fund things uh, and, and, and do the best level of election administration ever. And then of course, other counties that aren't. And even in some of these states, the, the even with the resources, uh, you see that they're you know they're not they're not funding their own election boards as well. If we want every citizen in America to have the same access to ballots and, and have a reasonable access to uh, the vote, then we need to make sure that we are funding uh, local election boards, and that funding has to come from the federal and the state level as well as their host counties. And so we need equal partners for, among all three. Only the federal government can do this. And that is why it's so important to keep pushing them on this, not just to do it because the presidential election is coming, but do consistent funding each and every year so we can build up our election infrastructure, replace aging equipment, and also uh, properly train and be ready for every election, not just the presidentials, not just the high uh, profile ones, and consistent federal funding will allow us to fill those gaps and be able to bring all of our counties up to a level that is acceptable to all voters. Thank you very much. So my last question um, is about what more we can do. We, we, we put together this campaign, um, Faces of Democracy um, to fill this gap that we think was 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 there really a bipartisan campaign that's diverse, um, but that it's also a movement of election officials and poll workers that um, are putting the pressure to 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 get these resources to get these protections to defend our democracy. Um, what more can we do um, as a cohort as a campaign um, to meet the needs that you're seeing on the ground, Secretary? It's making sure that we are out there first with information, that we're educating voters as much as we can about the process, educating voters about what it takes to run an election, to understand what safeguards are in place, what type of infrastructure we have in there to let voters know that their ballot is secure, adding transparency to the process any way we can, but controlling the message first and using real data and real facts in that messaging before the others get out there and start making falsehoods about things that aren't actually happening. Yeah, I agree. Thanks. Tanya, turning to you, that last question. I think we need to make sure we keep the conversation going. Mm -hmm. um, we had the ear of legislators this week and they sat down and talked to us, but you know, some, we would walk in and their assistant would say, we have eight minutes. You, you know, you want to get everything in that you can. And I think keeping a conversation, staying in touch, um, educating our voters, educating our voters is huge. That's elections have been an ever, ever changing cycle, but as we're educating our voters, we also need to educate the people who are funding us, um, and make sure that they're hearing from every level. Like we had the opportunity to, to have last week. I mean, to go from poll workers to secretary of states, um, people on the ground election officials, it, it was an amazing experience. And I think it made an impact to give us a face-to-face -face conversation that hadn't been happening in the past. Thank you, Tanya. And last word with you, Dustin, before we turn to questions. Yeah, uh, I, I obviously what Secretary Aguilar and Commissioner uh, Wickman have said is in, important. Uh, I guess I would just say to add to both of those is to continue to humanize election workers across uh, 
uh, the United States. And that's what's great about the faces of democracy, because many times we're faceless bureaucrats. People don't even think about us until it's election time. And that's usually because we're doing a good job and, 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 and there are no problems. And, and so that's, that's great. But understanding that the people who make up election offices, from poll workers all the way up to the lead election officials, are your friends. They're your neighbors. They're the people that go to church with you. They're the people who are in your community. And mo most of the time, they are doing it at a great sacrifice to their own personal wealth and their own uh, you know, time and energy because they believe in democracy. That's why we do it. And so understanding that will lead to funding, will lead to uh, lowering the temperatures and hopefully protection of these election workers as well. Thank you so much, Dustin. Um, I now wanna just turn it over for questions. Um, if you have a question, please put your hand up in the chat or in the Zoom um, app and we'll go one by one. No questions? Somebody has to have a good question. I know, somebody has that <laughs> question. We love to tell you about elections. Ask any <laughs> What can we do as individuals? What can the public do? What can voters do and individuals do? Who'd like to go first and answer that question? Uh, whatever, <laughs> Tanya, why don't you go and then I'll follow up. Okay, um, I think encourage people to talk to their local election officials. And um, there's a lot of mis and disinformation that even like when I would post something just for information on our social media, we'd have a, a post on everything I would put on there that was misinformation, um, you know, telling them that early voting, absentee voting, um, we changed their votes. We did those, you know, we didn't count their ballots. We threw them away. We never mailed them, those types of things. Um, talk to your election officials if you hear that type of thing. I actually give my personal cell phone number to every one of my poll workers. And if they're having a conversation with someone at dinner that their friends will, this is this and this. I said, if you don't know the answer, call me. I will, I will explain every detail as long as they'll listen to me. And then I'll ask them to be a poll worker and then they'll stop saying it. But, <laughs> you know, those types of things, the, as an individual, if you hear someone that doesn't understand it, encourage them to reach out to the people who's actually doing it. Yeah, I just to, to jump on that, I mean, individuals can help so much. I, I know a lot, a lot of times we say, oh, well, you know, what can I do? I'm just one person. But you're one person who reaches hundreds and hundreds of people a day. If you're, if you're on social media, follow your local board of elections uh, and, and retweet or repost their posts. Make sure it's their posts. Uh, because that is one of the ways that we can fight disinformation online, is to get that information directly from the experts. Also, become a poll worker. We need poll workers. We're going to need ever more uh, poll workers. And I know it's scary, and I know a lot of the stories out there, but most of the time, you're just in your polling place, serving your friends and neighbors, and making and people are very respectful and grateful for your service. So we need poll workers. We need people that are willing to be part of it. And then we're incredibly transparent. Boards of elections are built on transparency. And if you have any questions about our procedures, uh, please come talk to us. We'll love to talk to you about our procedures. We, you know, we'll we'll talk you blue in the face about our procedures mm -hmm. if you let us. But but. To, we're also proud of them. We, we're proud of all the work we do to make sure that every vote counts and that nobody is, uh, um, no votes are changed, nothing like that, that we're getting to the true winner of every contest. And remember, every election, there are people from both sides of the aisles that are elected inside each jurisdiction. So it's, you know, believing the results of elections has to start becoming as a uh, fundamental uh, belief in our country as it used to be. And, and that's uh, something else that we can pass along as individuals. Thank you, Dustin. Secretary, do you have an answer to that question as well? 
it's Kim, I'm going to go back to the same thing. And I think Dustin and Tanya said this. Election workers are our heroes and we need to respect them and we need to participate in the process. If there's ever a time to call for volunteers and engagement, right now is that time. We need people to come see the process, to understand the process and tell their friends that, hey, this is, they're doing a great job and we need to respect them for it. Thank you, Secretary. Any other questions? I think Ethan, did you wanna ask a question? I see you speaking. You're muted though. I'm unmuted now. Okay. So I, I feel like I'm cheating since I'm you know, an issue one person and <laughs> um, chief of strategy and program here. But I am interested in hearing from each of you two things, from each of you two things. One is, what is it really that made you want to do this of all the different kinds of public service that there is? And then secondly, if you were recruiting a hesitant poll worker, what would you say to get them to say yes? Who would like to take a stab? I'll go first. Um, you know, I ran for Secretary of State. This is my first elected office that I've ever held. And the reason I did it is Clark County in Las Vegas, the fifth largest school district in the country, majority minority with not very great educational outcomes. And I've been in the education space my whole life. You know, I had a previous boss named Jim Rogers, Andre Agassi, and they said, you have to find your passion and pay your community rent. And when you find that community rent and you start working, it doesn't become, it's just your passion. And I had the opportunity to build a new Catholic high school, which serves, you know, a vulnerable community in Las Vegas. And on election day, I was standing to, talking to the students and I said, hey, did your parents vote? Are you, are you planning to vote? And they all looked at me and just said, it doesn't matter. People don't want us to vote. They don't want to know what we have to say. And it just broke my heart because if we're going to change the educational landscape in Nevada, these are the exact parents we need to get to polls to demand more and expect more and hold our elected officials accountable for what they're investing in public education. And I thought, you know, this is a time when I need to step up and I need to fight and we need to protect that access to the ballot box. Because if we don't get people to the ballot box, we're going to continue to erode in a direction that we don't want. And we need to get as many people engaged in the process so we have a better understanding of where to take our state in the future. And that's what drove me to run. If I was talking to a hesitant election worker, which I do all the time because we're continually trying to recruit folks to the department and the division, is say, hey, I have your back. We convinced the legislature would pass our felony bill unanimously in both houses. This was not a Democratic or Republican issue. This was a Nevada issue. And even our governor, who is a Republican, understood the importance of this and stood there with me when we signed the bill to say, we protect our election workers and we have your back and we will defend you. Thank you. Others, Tanya or Dustin? Um, I will say, I don't think anybody ever as a child grows up and says, I want to be an election official. I mean, that's just no, because nobody knew who we were before now. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> I got started because my dad actually worked as a seasonal worker at our office since I was a kid up until, you know, I was interested in switching jobs at the time. So I, I remember the one year um, he was a vote location manager and he was the night before the election, he had a heart attack and we're sitting at the hospital and he looks at me because, you know, my mom's crying and my sister's stressing and he goes, you have to call Laura and tell her where the key is. And I have to get this information for the polls tonight, right now. And I was like, I think that's really not important right now. You know, you're, you're having a heart attack. I think that's not a priority. And I could never understand until I started working here, yeah. what that passion actually means. Um, it's, it's something that you, you learn to love. And it's, it's been the last couple of years, a love hate relationship um, with what I do. Um, but you do, you believe in it so much, which, you know, I think when, when people say things that you are doing it wrong or you're lying, that kind of thing, the, the comments from people who are actually involved are like, Oh, I don't know why you let that bother you. It's not a big deal. Don't let it bother you. But the fact that we all believe in it so much, it, it does bother you. You want to find a way to make a difference, that type of thing. Um, as for a hesitant poll worker, I think they all are. It's a long day. Um, but we've, we've tried just 
jokingly to kind of make it fun, we started theming our elections. Um, this time we're doing a baseball theme because we're going to knock it out of the park and show everybody how we run elections, but encourage them to enjoy each other. I mean, I, I have poll workers that recruit other poll workers because they want to spend the day with them, that type of thing. But it's it's always a great sell on the potlucks. I mean, poll workers have the best potlucks out there everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> but we do remind them, you know, that we are watching out for them and how important it is to have the opportunity to help people have their voice heard. I mean, it's it's not just a very underpaid position and a really long day. I mean, you're given an opportunity that people have fought for for years to put us here. You know, over a hundred years ago, I couldn't even vote, let alone be an election official. So there's been a fight, an ongoing fight, year after year after year, that it's an opportunity to be a part of. Even if it's just the one day on election being a poll worker, it's an important, an important position that people need to step up for. I uh I had a different route through life than many people. I had a kid very young. And I ended up raising her by myself. Uh, and at that time, so that did not allow me to do the traditional college route. And I actually, to better myself, was starting to work on political campaigns, volunteering anytime I could. And I almost treated it like a trade school. Uh, and as I was uh, going through the political campaigns, I realized I hated fundraising, didn't want to do that. Uh, it wasn't very uh, fond of messaging or those kind of things. What I really liked was GOTV, uh, getting out the vote and getting that rush of finding that one person who has never voted before, but they're going to go out this time and vote for the first time or watching an 18 year old fill out that voter registration form for the fir first time. That was something that really appealed to me. And so, you know, after you know, over a decade of working on campaigns and being the person that ended up working with the Board of Elections a lot on those campaigns uh, to do voter registration drives, petition challenges, uh, petition drives, all of the all of the functions that the, from the outside interacted with the Board of Elections. When the job became open, uh, I decided I wanted to run for it. And uh, it's a party appointed position here in New York, but it's like 800 people. It's not, it's like a village election. And uh, I was able to win and uh, it's been, uh, I, I gotta be honest, when I ran for the job, I thought I knew what the job was. I had no idea what the job was and I've learned a lot more each and every year and the job keeps changing. And that's one of the things I love about it. Uh, it is also one of the things that you can kind of hate about that is always like an, another challenge, but um, it is something that I, uh, I, 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 it's one of the honors of my life to be an elections commissioner. Um, to uh, lead my caucus of commissioners as well, and be able to have an impact uh, to make sure there are more people that have that rush of registering and voting for the first time. And that's what drives me. Hmm. Thank you. Um, we had another question come in about um, the rewards um, of, of your jobs. And I think Tanya, you and Dustin, you know, spoke a little bit about it, but Secretary, um, in your new role, you, you had a recent victory, um, getting a, an important bill passed. Um, what, was that rewarding? Can you speak a little bit about that and any other rewards that you're feeling already in your position? Yeah, it's, you know, I think election workers also to understand that this is a team sport. This is not an individual sport and you're so dependent on each other and being part of a team that's passionate about a fundamental right that every American has. It's the one thing that makes us equal and to know that somebody who feels they don't have a voice finally have a voice and visiting our rural communities talking with our tribal leaders about what voting means and why it's important and seeing them engage in that process is a beautiful thing and it's giving somebody a voice who necessarily doesn't always have a voice and how do we do that and how do we do it in a way that's benefit for the state as a whole and not an individual party so it's the election workers you know it's seeing new clerks come on board and being able to feel as though, hey, we have their back, we're gonna to listen to you, we're gonna be there to support you, and we gotta do this together. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions for our panelists? I see Ethan ask me a question. Are you talking about scandal? <laughs> <laughs> If, if you all don't know, the show Scandal was based on Defiance County, Ohio. You know, 
I, I want to clarify for everyone's benefit that we never use that type of equipment. There are so many trophies in this trophy case at Defiance High School that there truly is no space to put on display a piece of voting equipment that still has results in it. <laughs> so um, it's it's a great, great introduction when I go places because nobody knows where Defiance Ohio is, but they will watch Scandal. So <laughs> I just want Tanya to know that I used to watch Scandal and when that episode came out, I stopped watching Scandal because I was so offended by all the tropes in that episode about how you know, election uh, election officials would just leave uh, a piece of equipment for, you know, several days for somebody to swap out. It's just crazy. I know. I yelled at the TV, but it's still a <laughs> I think, Jamie, did you have a question you wanted to? I do. Thanks. And thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, I've got a question about election funding. I think the the wildest fact that I, I learned since getting involved in democracy reform is that there's actually no regular sustainable funding for elections from the federal government. So that's um, something that I am, am sitting with. And you know, I think well, the question I want to ask is how hopeful are you that after the fly-in, Congress can be convinced to regularly fund elections? Um, and when I say regularly, like multi-year commitments, um, what do you have any reflections from the fly-in or are there any moments that that gave you hope? I think that's something I'm really curious to hear more about. I, I, look, I'm an optimistic person, but also too, optimism only gets you so far. It takes <laughs> commitment and effort and continually, continuing to persuade mm -hmm. and argue and present your case. It's creating a sense of urgency. And I think issue one gave us the platform to create that sense of urgency but it's going to take a lot of follow-up and it's going to be me forcing my two bipartisan con members of Congress to recognize the role they have. That's unique. Our Republican member sits on the subcommittee that actually handles the I line item budget. And then Susie uh, from the South, the Democrat can work on making sure it gets to the appropriations committee as a whole and is a priority. So it's elevating their story and their partnership to the rest of the country to say, Hey, let's put partisan politics, politics aside and let's invest in something that gets us to where we all are. Yeah, I wanna jump on that too. Uh, if it was easy to get it, it would already been done. Uh, and uh, you know, federal government has historically stayed out of elections. So we're trying to change that. And it's not gonna be something that's done next year. It's not gonna be done some, something that's done uh, you know, any, any time uh, in, in, in the way that we want it in the next couple of years. But that being said, we're starting the conversation. And uh, once we achieve funding, we're going to have to continue to push for consistent funding. Because again, there's always going to be people who think everything's resolved. Everything's running fine. Well, it's all running fine because you gave us the money, and, but we need that every year. So um, it, it's uh, it, this is a huge <clears throat> challenge and a huge, uh, uh, you know, it, it will take a, a huge investment of time and money. and. Uh, uh, and issue one is I'm so glad leading the way here on this and I'm happy to be a part of it. But uh, so this will not be solved short term, but we're in it for the long term. So I think too, the, the fly-in gave us a unique opportunity to offer our services, to offer the explanation, um, make a connection where if you have questions on elections or if you don't understand why we're asking for funding, you know, we're right there for the local at the local level, um, state level, it gives you an opportunity to ask everybody the questions that you need to know if you're questioning, well, they make it look really easy. They don't need more money. Well, there, there is the funding that's necessary. So we can explain it step-by-step by, step by having face-to-face -face conversations or just leaving our business cards behind and saying, mm -hmm. please reach out. Thanks. I have one last question um, that we can close with, which is about election deniers that are on local boards um, and local governments, um, do you have concerns about the role that they can play um, in the elections process at the local level um, and how sort of more high level state or national figures and candidates could put pressure on them leading into 2024? Just curious to hear your thoughts on that. 
my concern would be with the public narrative of it. Um, there are so many safeguards put into place for elections that people don't realize are there. Um, I'd like to believe there would be a minimal amount that they could do other than misinform. Mm -hmm. um, but the checks and balances, at least like in my area, I can speak for Ohio, the checks and balances are there to make sure that everything is done to the letter of the law. I'm not as worried about election deniers on the local boards because I do think that the people who tend to gravitate towards this type of work tend to believe in this type of work. And while there are instances around the country of you know some uh, subversion candidates getting in there, I, I think that's less worrisome to me than election deniers on state legislatures, on county legislators, on in Congress. That that's wor what worries me more because it's so uh, you know it, 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 it's so you know woven into what they do each and every day, and they can limit funding. They can you know pass rules that we can't implement that will make us look um, you know incompetent. These are the things that I worry about more. Is the the deniers that are uh, involved in rulemaking and lawmaking as opposed to the election officials. Mm. Thank you. And last word with you, Secretary. Absolutely, it's a concern, but it may, we have to have a plan and we have to be ready for it. And we have to start executing now. It's, you know, our team and my elections deputy, Mark Velashin, does a phenomenal job of working with our 17 clerks throughout the state. And that trust is something that has to remain strong. We have to be there to support them because they're taking directives sometimes from their county commissioners, but they're also to elected officials in themselves. And so they understand the importance of this position. It's making sure they have the tools and resources to do that job well. Well, thank you. It looks like Ethan, you have your hand up. I do, I do. I wanted, I wanted just to jump in and, and say thank you, but also to share a 30 second anecdote which is that on Tuesday, I was in my home state of Connecticut where I used to do politics and I was at a cross-partisan, bipartisan political event. After the event, we all start kibitzing and trading war stories. And then that led to conversations about recounts, right? And, and the upswing of which was, well, recounts almost never change the outcome of an election. And we went through the congressional one that we had of two votes, the state rep one of four votes, the current speaker won his primary by one vote. And before I had a chance to say anything, one of the people at the table said, wow, I guess election workers really make a difference. You know, and it just like with all this talk about fraud, people just forget, right, that when there are recounts, almost always the results are the same because you always almost always 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 get it right and for that we are deeply deeply appreciative and with that thank you ethan and thank you to all of you who joined us today a special thanks uh, to secretary uh, tanya and dustin for taking time um, we are really grateful for you what you do for our country and um, grateful that you came to washington and we are so proud to support you and advocate for you. So thank you so much. And I wish you all a good afternoon. Thank you all. Appreciate it.